Hello, everybody, and welcome to the first in a new series of Google CERN Hangouts. Now, if you're new to this, don't worry. You can catch up with all our previous Hangouts on our YouTube channel, and they cover every aspect of anything you've ever wanted to know about particle physics. And if they don't, don't worry. We're going to fill you in on the details in this new series. Thanks also to all of you that sent in your questions for Monday's Reddit Ask Me Anything session about the CERN scientists. If you missed that, you can look at it on the web. If you didn't get a chance to ask any questions, don't worry. The Hangouts are your chance to ask us anything. Now, today, we want to bring you bang up to date with what's been happening at CERN. And you might think that because the LHC hasn't been operating for over a year now, that we've just been essentially having a good holiday. Well, what we want to show you today is that that's really not the case. We've been working really, really, really hard. You might remember that the Nobel Prize last year went to Peter Higgs and Francois Anglais for their prediction of the Higgs boson that was discovered almost two years ago now at the LHC. Well, since then, <laughs> that we're very happy about, since then we've been analyzing our data, looking for more information about the Higgs, looking to understand what elusive dark matter is made of, looking to understand the behavior of antimatter and a ton of other stuff. And this is a really good moment to bring us bang up to date, because last week was our Large Hadron Collider Physics Conference, LHCP for short. And we're going to be talking about all the latest results that were shown there. And I am delighted that joining me this week to talk about it are the wonderful Steve Goldfarb of the Atlas Experiment, who was actually there at the conference. Hello. Um, Hi, Steve. <laughs> and also, live from somewhere looking extremely high-tech, we have Patrick Koppenberg of the LHCB experiment, and we'll find out exactly where he is later on. And we have our social media maestro, Seth Zenz. We'll be keeping an eye on all your questions and feeding them to us. So any questions, send them in on Twitter with the Ask CERN hashtag, or type them into the comments bar on Google+, or wherever you happen to be looking, and we'll chase them up. If we don't get a chance to answer them here, we'll answer them after we've finished. Right, so before we get started, it's quite traditional that we have a trivia question to get us into the mood of thinking about CERN. So, Steve, what do we have this time? Well, you might or might not know, probably from our logo, you guessed it. It's the 60th anniversary of CERN. 60 years ago, CERN was founded. Now, we have a question for you, and that question is this. The foundation cornerstone, the very beginning, the first thing you lay to construct something, for what accelerator, that is, what was the name of the accelerator, and you got to get that name right, was laid in 54 or 55, depends on our sources, it probably was 1955, but about 60 years ago, the very first accelerator, that foundation was laid you tell us the name of that accelerator that really launched the physics program here at CERN? So we want the name of that first accelerator, send in your answers, and then we'll announce the actual answer at the end. And win valuable prizes. Apparently. <laughs> okay, so, so let's get started. And maybe, Seth, let's go to you. Have we had any good questions that will start us off on our session today before we start talking to the experts? Okay, so um, one question we got already on Twitter from Rebecca Markov is, what are you going to do research on when you open the LHC again? That is an incredibly good question. And in fact, that question is sort of what we'll be dealing with today, because by bringing you up to date with all of our latest results, of course, you're going to see what we haven't found out yet and what else we need to find out, which is going to really tell us what we'll be looking for when we start up the LHC again. So I think as we go through and discuss what our latest results are, then we'll, we'll address that question too. So thank you. We'll, we'll spend the half hour dealing with that one. Yes. So firstly, then, let's catch up with the latest results. And Patrick, you're looking very fetching in a hard hat. Tell us where you are. It looks very intriguing over there. Yes, hello Tara. I'm in a place where indeed certain rules tell me I have to wear a hard hat. I'm in the uh, underground area next to the LHCB detector, so I'm 100 meters underground. 100 meters above me is roughly Geneva Airport. So I'm just at the border between uh, Switzerland and France, 
And uh, so my dear assistant now is showing you the LHCB detector. Unfortunately, I cannot really see what he's, uh, what he's showing. This apparatus is the whole LHCB detector. You have uh, now, if I'm looking at where he's pointing, here is roughly the uh, interaction point. So we are very special in the sense that we do not have the interaction point in the middle of the detector. We have it on the side. And actually, the collisions are outside of the cavern, just at the entrance of the LHC tunnel. And then we look at the particles that flow inside of the cavern in this direction. There is the other half of the particles going in the other direction. We lose them. They go through a magnet here in blue. Then these red uh, slices are three stra tracking stations. We have a detector that allows us to identify part uh, particles. Uh, in yellow, you have calorimeters that are very good at identifying photons and electrons. And then in the back in green are the muon chambers that are specialized in uh, particles called muons. And I, I will mention those again, because it's actually part of our highlight results for the LHCP conference. So Patrick, before you tell us about the highlights, just, just remind us, why does LHCP have that strange shape? It's very unlike Atlas and CMS. Yes, because Atlas and CMS, they're optimized for looking for uh, for heavy particles. Of course, a lot of new particles that have not yet been discovered, but also, of course, the Higgs boson. That, <clears throat> that weighs about 125 GV, which is, <clears throat> which is 125 the mass of the, of the proton, roughly. We are looking for particles that are much lighter than that, about 5 GV, so five times the mass of the proton. And the physics tells us that the lighter a particle is, the more likely it is to fly along the beam. So since we are interested in these particles, we want to look at what is very close to the beam line, going either in one direction or the other. And, uh, and the, the heavier particles that tend to go up the roof, we don't catch them. We leave them to Atlas and CMS. Right. So LHCB, in short, then, can look at quite different types of physics to Atlas and CMS. So, so tell us, what have LHCB found? What are our physics highlights? So the, <clears throat> we are doing precision measurement of, a, of, a particle, of particles containing the B quark. The, the reason why we're doing that is because uh, uh, decays of the B quark involve higher, heavier particles, the kind of particles that Atlas and CMS are trying to find directly. We see them indirectly and in, in quantum loops. So they are created for a very short period of time, do something, and then, and then uh, mediate a decay. So we are, we are studying the decay of uh, of these particles containing B quarks. And, uh, <clears throat> and by analyzing these decays and measuring precisely the rates and uh, also the direction of particles coming out of these decays, that tell us something about the particles that we do not see that were created for a short time inside these decays. So for instance, one thing that we have uh, reported at LHCP, we have looked at a very, very rare decay of, the, of a particle containing a B quark. That, that occurs with a probability of, uh, of, of less than one in a million. And uh, that goes to, to a kaon, which is a particle I don't want to describe in too much details, and two muons, which are these, these particles that are caught by this detector over there. And the standard model, the, part, the, the, the theory of particle physics, tells us that this decay rate should be exactly identical to the decay rate of the same particle to going to a kaon and two electrons. Because muons and electrons are essentially the same particle. They only differ in their mass. And uh, what we've measured is that this ratio of decay rates is not 1, but 0 0.75. So there is a difference. We have uh, some uncertainty of about 10% on that number. So you could say that it's still somehow compatible with being one, and we need much more data to really understand whether this is a significant difference or whether it's just a statistical fluctuation because we don't have enough data yet. And well, we will certainly pursue that, but, uh, but we are, of course, very excited about seeing this deviation. I'm not surprised because this assumption that we should get as many decays to muons as electrons, it's a really fundamental cornerstone of the standard model. So to see some differences start emerging might start telling us that our understanding of particle physics isn't right, and it might be showing us what might be right beyond it. So are there any thoughts as to what types of new physics might explain something like this, even if we're not sure whether it's a real um, phenomenon or not yet? Is it, do we have any feeling for what might explain this? 
Well, there are essentially two possibilities that if we're going in that direction. The most popular one is the, are the models that add additional Higgs to the standard models that include charged Higgses. You know that the Higgs is coupling to mass. It's the, it, it's the particle that explains mass, and therefore the higher a, um, the mass of a particle, the more likely it is to be coupled to the Higgs. So if you add charged that interact in these uh, decays, you could have differences between the rate to electrons than to muons because the, uh, the muon is 200 times heavier than the electron. So that's one possibility, but it's not that favored because it would also imply that the uh, rate of another highlight decay, which is the BS to mu decay that happens at the rate of one in a billion, should be, ex should be higher than what is predicted by the standard model. And what we have measured uh, at LHCb and also, uh, and also at CMS is something very compatible with the standard model. So this doesn't seem to be the, the right direction for an explanation. There, has also been, uh, there have also been theories that have, that, uh, have tried to understand and to, to explain other asymmetries that we have uh, measured in LHCb adding other particles to the standard model, and uh, in particular a Z prime boson. The Z boson is a heavy particle uh, that is, uh, that is resp responsible for the weak interaction in particular of neutrinos, and, uh, and it could have a partner that is 100 times heavier. And if this particle exists, then there's actually no, a priori you would expect that it also should be democratic in terms of of electrons and muons, but it doesn't have to. So if it do, if it does not, then that could explain this uh, this difference. And this is this if this is the case, then that would be very exciting because it would it would set uh, the energy scale at which we should start to look for for other particles. Uh, but it would also be very unfortunate because that would mean that this energy scale would be beyond the reach of the LHC. Gosh, so this is clearly going to be a good candidate then for something we really want to pin down when we get more data when the LHC restarts. Thanks very much, Patrick. We might come back to you for some more highlights in a moment. But particularly because you mentioned Higgs, I'd like to turn to Steve now. Steve, you were at the LHCP conference, I believe. Yes, indeed. Live there. Uh -huh. So tell us, what were the highlights of Higgs and other physics like that? Higgs was a very important topic. Both Atlas, CMS had a lot to say about it. Uh, what we've been doing the past two years is, is a mix of things. One, one is analyzing our data. We can analyze that uh, for some time because well, we, have this, this, we don't have new data coming in. So we can look at things, we can recalibrate, we can improve our measurements, get new techniques. We learn from each other, especially at conferences like this. Uh, and as a result, our measurements get refined. And this is very important, not just so that the current measurements are refined, but so that in the future, when we get more statistics, we'll be able to explore and be ready for discovery. So I would say some of the highlights, um, my colleagues uh, at, at CMS have a beautiful measurement they've done uh, with the width uh, of, the, um, of the Higgs. And that's rather important when you have a distribution of, of mass. The mass is not an exact number. I know when we stand on the scale, well, when I stand on the scale, uh, it, it goes up quite a bit, more than for her, and, um, and it goes to an exact number. Uh, but it's not really the case uh, when you measure things. When you measure the mass of particles, you'll find that they have a kind of a distribution. Uh, they appear at, at different masses, and that's very natural. This is, this is part of the uncertainty that's inherent to, to quantum mechanics. If you can measure the width Actually, it tells you a lot about it. it tells you how quickly that particle is going to decay. The bigger the width, the more chance it has it's going to decay quickly. And so, by learning the width of, of the uh, of the mass of the Higgs, our friends in, in CMS were finding out uh, what its lifetime. Essentially, they're getting information on lifetime. You, you take one, you divide it by the other, you, you get the lifetime to find out how long it's going to live. And that's very important information. The Higgs now, it was a discovery two years ago. We're done with that. It's a tool. It's a tool. And we're going to use that tool to find new physics. That's what we're intent on. Okay? We, don't, we don't like that for 50 years these theorists have been right. right? None of us are happy. That. Even the theorists aren't happy that they've been right for 50 years. They want us to find something new. But That's Steve, what Patrick's but Steve, is, is yeah. it fair to say that although we've discovered the Higgs, we've discovered the Higgs in the standard model. I mean, there is a difference. Ah, There's yeah. the Higgs that was predicted by Peter Higgs and put into the standard model. 
And there are other Higgses associated with all manner of crazy theories out there in the universe. Yes. So just which Higgs are you talking about? Well, which theory is crazy? Uh, the standard model doesn't answer everything, right? So it's, it's nice, it's great, lasted 50 years, but its time has come. There are other theories out there which might explain some of the other things that we see in the universe, which the standard model just doesn't include. It looks great on a t-shirt and on a mug, but it doesn't answer everything. So that's why we try so hard to explore it. Now, we don't know. Uh, this Higgs that we keep measuring and measuring and measuring behaves. It smells, it sounds, it looks like the standard model Higgs boson, predicted. But you have to measure the details. We've only got thousand or so of these things. We need to get many more, and we need to prepare for them. So our friends at CMS, they were measuring the width. We were very carefully measuring uh, the, the mass of, of the Higgs boson by better calibrating our detectors. The better you understand your detector, the better you can calibrate it from other data you've taken, uh, the, better, the more precise the measurement you can make. Now, this is very important because when you make measurements with our experiments, with that beautiful experiment uh, behind Patrick there and with the other experiments around the LHC, you get answers out and they have uncertainty to them. There's two sources of uncertainty. One are things that you just don't know about your detector or about the theory. So you just, you, you can measure something and you'll find out that when you do the same measurements that there's, there's a variation of You have to account for that. It's called a systematic error. Then you have an error called the statistical error, which is just that you've only collected this much statistics. And so you can only say, according to the statistics, what you know. Okay? We know that we want both of those errors to go down. The only way to get statistical error to go down is to have more data, which we're going to get soon. Uh, but we can do a lot of work and improve our systematics. Uh, the, my, my friends, my colleagues on Atlas work very hard, and they reduce the systematic error on the mass of the Higgs measurement by a factor of three, which is huge. Gosh. In our business, that's Gosh. huge. That is almost unprecedented, because it might come as a shock to you, but if you're a particle physicist, almost all you do is try and reduce your errors to get your measurement more precise. It's what takes 95% of the time. Yeah. So that's an achievement. It's, yeah, it's amazing. You know, you, you'll see a result. They'll say the answer is, you know, uh, 32 plus or minus 5 plus or minus 6. All the work went into that plus or minus 5 plus or minus 6. It's, it's all there, um, you know, to, to calculate the mass uh, of, of four muons coming out of the center detector you use one line of code. But all the work, as you said, Tarab, goes into calculating these errors. So right now, we're really happy because we have the systematics down well below the statistics. So when we go in and we measure many, many more Higgs bosons, which we're going to get next year, uh, we might be able to say something. We might be able to say whether we learned something more about the properties of the Higgs boson, whether it's this standard model Higgs boson, whether there, it's, it's not, whether it doesn't fit. Um, hopefully, you know, signs like what, what Patrick might be seeing in LHCB, uh, you know, we don't know. His, his error is not yet, his, his uncertainty is not yet small enough to really say something conclusive, um, but it could happen. It just takes more data. Um, so, so these were a couple of the highlights. Higgs was, was important here. Right. So um, we're learning more, but we need more data to be sure of anything is what you're saying. Yes. Yes. To find out if there's something else out there. So that, those are the Higgs highlights, I would say. For okay. And, and before we open it up to questions, I just want to ask, has anybody seen any evidence of supersymmetry yet? Supersymmetry, if you remember, is our, our favored theory that might explain what dark matter, what 85% of the stuff in the universe that we just can't see is made of. And last time I looked, you know, the jury was out on if, it, if we were going to see it or not. Any update? Yeah, well, you know, it sort of depends on who gives the talk. And, and their optimism. Uh, <laughs> it's good news. The good news is that we've, we've narrowed it down, the area that where you look for supersymmetry. Uh, we're looking for uh, gluinos and uh, selectrons and things like this. We're looking for these supersymmetric partners. There's a beautiful model out there called supersymmetry. There's actually several models of supersymmetry. These beautiful models could help us to understand many things which the standard model doesn't answer. Why we have these three families of particles. Patrick talked about electrons and muons. Why should they exist? Why on earth do we need something besides an electron? Why do we need these muons? Um, but they're there. So something has to explain them, why they have different masses. Muons are much more massive. They decay to, to electrons. Um, why does that exist? And why is there such a, you know, what are their values of mass? Where does that come from? They're really different values of mass. There's, there's no, you know, real sense to that. Um, 
and, 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 and help to answer all these other questions we have. I mean, we can only account for, what, 4% of the universe? We're missing all, all, most of the matter out there. We don't even know what it is, what's making uh, galaxies spin at the rate that they do. There's stuff out there we don't know about. Supersymmetry is one possible theory that not only solves some of these, these other problems, but could also give us particles which we can't detect and which could be what is inside these galaxies. So, unfortunately, <laughs> the real answer is that supersymmetry was not found. Yes, I think. Not found yet. Yeah, we, one highlight that was put up, we had a, a guest, a Dennis Overby from the New York Times, a very famous science writer from the New York Times, was with us at the conference. And his uh, title of an article that he had written he claimed the editors had changed the title. Came from many years back, which said that you know 3,000 physicists failed to find supersymmetry. We're still failing to find supersymmetry, but we're failing better and better to find supersymmetry. You've got to look for it. That's what we do in our field. We look and look and look. That's all we can do. Can I jump in here and ask maybe more concretely, because we have a we have a question from Awkward Quark on YouTube, which is how do we test supersymmetry at the LHC? What are we doing exactly to find it? Good question. After all, Steve, if it predicts something we can't see, how are we going to see it? Well, there, there's several things. Well, if it's, it's, it's okay, there's very many different ways it can come into it. And, and Seth, you can also add in here because Seth is also is a is a physicist on CMS. And there are so many ways. I'm going to come to Patrick at the end. And as Patrick, well. Patrick right. too. So there there are many different ways. Now, how to look for nothing? So these things, independent of of supersymmetry, in fact. We can talk about dark matter. Okay, it could be a part of supersymmetry. It could be a part of something else. We don't know. How do you look for something that you can't see? Well, you build detectors which are completely surrounding the collision point. At least that's what we do for for Atlas and CMS. We completely surround the collision point. You guys know. Um, actually, can you, Kate, can you put up the picture of the Higgs from Atlas there? Okay, you see this picture here. Um, You'll see, this is, this is, I'm biased, it's the Atlas detector, but it'll look the same, almost the same for, for some Yeah, it's okay, it's okay, it's the same idea. Uh, you see that, that we have the, the collision point completely surrounded by detector. And so when you do that, you know, especially all the bright people listening to us know, conservation of momentum means that there should be an even distribution of energy, of, of momentum actually all the way around the collision point in this plane. And so if you add up the vectors of momentum of everything you measure, they should come up to zero. And they do usually come out to zero or something close. Detectors aren't perfect, and you might miss some things. And there's these things which, which we call neutrinos, which are also in there, and we have to account for them. But if we start to see times where there's a large amount of missing energy in this plane, we get excited. And that can happen in the standard model under certain conditions, mm -hmm. but it shouldn't happen very often. So if we start seeing a lot of that, that that's a way to detect something you can't right. detect. You build a hermetic detector. So that's one way. Maybe, I don't know, there, there's a lot of other ways to look specifically for supersymmetry. Yeah, and perhaps, I perhaps I could ask Patrick, because in, in yeah. NHCB, we, we can't pull this trick of looking for what's not there, because mm -hmm. as you say, we're a different shape. But right. we do things a little bit differently. Patrick, tell us how in LHCB we have a handle on seeing if supersymmetry is in the data or not. Yeah, well, one thing that is great about the supersymmetric model is that they are very predictive. They are able to make predictions on decay rates of particles with great precision, the same precision as the standard model. There, there, are, there are some unknown parameters, so it depends on these parameters, but, you, but they, can, they can predict precisely assuming some of the masses of supersymmetric particles, what these decay rates are. And we can measure them precisely. And therefore, if we have a prediction of the standard model, a prediction from supersymmetry, and a precise experimental measurement, we could, in principle, tell if it's the standard model or supersymmetry that is right. So far, the standard model has always won. But there's always a parameter of, this, of supersymmetry that you can tune so that you get back to something that is close to the standard model for that particular measurement. But of course, we are improving our precision, adding more and more data, as Steve explained. So getting our statistical uncertainties and systematic uncertainties down. So eventually, we may be able to pinpoint 
that first the standard model is not right, and if we measure something, then we should actually be able to then say something about these parameters of supersymmetry in an indirect way, just by measuring a decay rate, say, well, the mass of the lightest supersymmetric particle has to be in that range, else this decay rate would not be what we measure. Yeah, so I think supersymmetry is really the theory that keeps giving, in a sense, and that you can never rule it out, and you can always look for it. And what's great about the LHC is that we have these two completely different ways of trying to find it. LHCb doesn't see it directly, like Atlas and CMS, but it has access to its effects, its influence on the behavior of particles we know about, and potentially over much heavier masses that can be seen directly inside the LHC. So these experiments work really well together. Gosh, so as you can see, we have been really busy with particle physics and results. So Seth, I'm sure there are more questions coming in. Give us another question that we can attack. OK, I think I'm going to go. We've had some really good questions on Twitter about extra dimensions. But I think maybe I'll let that go, because the answers are usually pretty much the same as for supersymmetry. Um, but actually, let me ask a far out question that I really liked, um, which is from um, Michael M.K. Nate. I'm sure I butchered that, sorry, on Facebook. Using your imagination and knowledge, what would happen if two Higgs boson particles collided with each other at the Hadron Collider? Wow, if two Higgs bosons collided with each other at the Hadron Collider. Hmm. Well, maybe, Seth, I'll get you, you to think about that first, <laughs> because you are a Higgs physicist on CMS, so you have the inside track in probably already thinking about that. Yes, I, I, I also picked the question, so I think <laughs> you get a little bit. Um, so this is tricky, because this can technically happen. When we collide two protons, some piece, some particle out of the proton, proton, a part of it, we call it a parton, comes out and the collision happens. Now usually that's an up quark or a down quark, but there's important things that happen with B quarks as well. Well, there's a tiny possibility you could get a Higgs boson out of the proton, just sort of appearing out of the vacuum at just the right time. And yeah, there's a, a Higgs boson hiding inside the proton. Yeah, exactly. And there's even an absurdly tinier chance that you could have that happen in both protons at once. And if that did happen, if the two Higgs bosons did collide, the standard model tells us exactly what would happen after that, which is that they would most likely decay either to a pair of W bosons or a pair of Z bosons. And we would never know that the Higgs had, had been there in a million years, even if it did happen once. Um, so it's a neat thought experiment to really exercise our models that predict things sometimes that we can't see at all. Maybe, maybe I can add to that. Uh, not, not looking for Higgs collisions, but actually looking for events with two Higgs was something presented at the LHCP conference. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't, I, I, sorry, I'm biased. I only remember that Atlas presented it, but probably CMS did as well. Um, they might have. I don't know. <laughs> I apologize for that. I tried to pay attention to all the talks, but you know, sometimes we step up for a coffee. But uh, it, it, at least in, in our results, we were looking for uh, Higgs. Uh, one of the Higgs decaying to two photons, one decaying to two uh, Bs. And now this is something which is very, very rare, at least at the current rate. So mm -hmm. the current data, it's more a matter of doing the exercise and trying to be ready for when we have much more data, which is going to happen in the years to come. Uh, and it's a very nice measurement because it will be very sensitive to new physics. It is possible to have you know, two, two Higgs bosons in the standard model, but the rate is extraordinarily low, much like what Patrick mentioned with this B sub S going to two muons, uh, which is one in a billion chance. We're used to these one in a billion things. It doesn't challenge us anymore. So we will look for these things. These very rare decays are very important because, uh, you know, Quick theory, the protons come in, they collide, they make something, and stuff comes out. Okay, there you go. There's the theory. Theorists fill in the blank, what went on inside there. And based on that theory they stick inside there, you can predict what's going to come out. Standard model sits in there, and it gives us one in a billion, for example, for the muons, or for these two Higgs, it gets a very, very small rate. But if you plug in something else in there, some other exciting new physics, it might give you higher rates. 
more chances of things getting produced inside there. If you have different types of particles that can get produced, they can produce other things. And so that's why we do this. That's why we look at all these rare things. Even though someone's telling us, oh, it's, it's very, very rare, uh, you're probably not going to find it. You've got to do it because it might be there, in, that case, in which case you'll, you'll know that there's something there. Something I'm, I'm fascinated to hear that because that's exactly the way we do physics on LHCb, that approach. You measure something, it can be influenced by new physics, you're looking for that difference and that's how we do our analyses. Yeah. Oh, oh the gosh. Should, should we find out? Yes, okay. time has gone so quickly. We haven't even finished finding out what our LHC results are. <laughs> you have to keep on asking us questions because Steve in particular has a really interesting result in front of him called Higgs Master String Rules. He hasn't been able to talk about oh, it. So please ask <laughs> us questions about it. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know the answer, but that's okay. They can ask a question. But maybe, maybe we should get to the to the um I think we need to know the answer to the trivia the point trivia as question. well, Steve. You gave us that poser at the start about that first accelerator at CERN. And do we, do we have an answer? You're, are you going to put, 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 put up the answer? Oh, you've got an answer. Somebody answered it? Yes. Okay. Who, get, who got the answer? So, um, Sungich Aminhas, another name I had trouble with, um, got the answer on YouTube. And the answer is the synchrocyclotron. Ah, synchrocyclotron. Exactly what I have scribbled on on my piece of paper here, this synchrocyclotron. Congratulations, Sunkit. Uh, where? Uh, well, Sunkit, you, know, you should, you should, when you get a chance, type in where you're from. That's, a, that's an awesome name. If that's your real name. It's, it's, um, I'm curious where that's from. Sunkit sounds uh, east. I, I can't guess. And well done for getting the yeah, correct answer. Yeah, good job. That's correct. Good job. Your, your valuable prize is a congratulations from all of us, a group hug. Yay. <laughs> good job. <laughs> keep, keep up. Keep following physics. Because you're so um, good at it already. That's all we can afford to give you. We're sorry. <laughs> but, uh, but, but please, if you come here, we will give you a tour. Okay, you come here, we'll, we'll take you around and show you. You heard that from yourself. Steve. I'll be glad Chase to Chase him up on it. <laughs> Okay, so I think that brings us to the end. That's all we have time for, I'm afraid, it, in, in the Hangout. But before oh, yeah. we go, before we go, <laughs> before we go our I have a couple okay. of announcements here. So if you want to carry on staying up to date with us, with the LHC, but you want to do it in a less formal aspect, tune in on Friday because we have a comedy night, the Comedy Collider, tomorrow night. Friday the 13th of June, don't let the date put you off. It starts at 8 p.m. European time, and it is webcast live from the globe. And we are going to have genuine stand-up particle physics comedy. Yes, there is such a thing, and it is going to be webcast, and you cannot miss it. So that's going to go on on Friday. And then next week, don't miss the second in our sessions of Hangouts with CERN. So we've been telling you about LHC physics and everything we've been doing. You might be wondering what the LHC itself has been getting up to. So next week's session is devoted to the LHC. Why is there no beam? Exactly what is happening with it? Prepare your questions, and the Hangout will be back next week to answer them all. Thank you for joining us. Bye.